the fun's over. Here I am. Okay, so that was an interesting uh, introduction. Good morning. Let's start as we always do with a little bit of music. Always seems to get you centered. Seems to get me centered anyway. And it'll get us in the spirit of worship, hopefully. And uh, so we'll now listen to God Moves in a Mysterious Way by uh, William Femister. And Craig is going to be playing that for us.
Well, God moves in mysterious ways, and so does that music. <laughs> it was one of the strangest things. Like, Where is this thing going? I really felt like they were crazy chords through, like, most of that song. You know, it resolved a bit at the end, thank God. Otherwise, I, I think I would have just melted. Okay, uh, well, that is not going to go into a review of the music. I guess it already did. So welcome, everybody, joining us today on this uh, uh, holiday weekend, and uh, if you're joining us on Facebook Live or through YouTube, uh, we welcome you also. Um, so not much to say except for Happy Yom Kippur. Hmm? You're welcome. Not the, not the right thing to say. Uh, yeah, to in, enjoy the celebration of Yom Kippur. Excuse me? Peaceful. Shalom, Yom Kippur. There we go. Okay, now that I screwed that up for all of the Jewish members of our congregation here, we'll move right along. <laughs> Anything else I could screw up for you? No? Okay. Here's one thing that I'd like to remind you of. We just got a poster done for this. If you want to take this to the, if you live in a, a community or there's a, a, a shopping center, you know, like there's in the Bible, one of my favorite phrases is don't hide your light under a basket. What is the point of a light, a candle, doing it, the ritual, and then you hide it from everybody so only you can see it. So this you could put up in uh, village, uh, village, whatever you call it, new village. What is it? It's, it is new village. I always get that village walk and new village mixed up. So on um, Sunday, November 3rd, I know it's a little while from now, we're going to have a concert here, an event actually called What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding. And the, that is actually the title of a brilliant song by Elvis Costello. I just saw last night uh, studying Burt Bacharach, uh, an Elvis Costello, Burt Bacharach album that was put out. Um, the subtitle of it is A Celebration of Compassionate Strength and Resilience. So it's two days before the election, and it's just saying, okay, we can decide that the world is splitting in half. We can decide that we're completely divided and we can't talk to each other, or we can decide that we can come to together in the name of peace, love, and understanding, knowing that on any subject, any time of the day, there's going to be an up, down, good, bad, favorable, not favorable, vote for, vote against, um, but that our unity and our strength and the things, that, especially around peace and love and understanding, are eternal messages, no matter what we're going through in our life. There will be music featured by Elvis Costello, Cat Stevens, Peter Gabriel, Bob Marley, Roseanne Cash, Louis Armstrong, and others. Performed by Miles Tadayton Trio, Rory Kelly, Anthony Pravada, Jonathan March, Toby Tobias, Kathleen Gubotosi, Kathy Youngquish, Rochelle Schmidt, Craig Coyle. And we're having a choreographed piece. I have to talk to you about the stage extender. Um, Wendy Wing, uh, the... New Yorker now, but uh, born and raised in China, choreographer and dancer who did the dance of loneliness around the balcony and then came in here. She's going to be doing um, the dance of peace. She's in China right now on a tour, and uh, she's an amazing dancer. I, if you haven't seen her, you've seen photographs of her that we've uh, promoted here. So all of that is for an admission, suggested submission of $10 or more or less. Because some people, a few people, don't have 10 bucks to spare. They give us five or they come in for free. And some people give us 100 bucks because they do have it to spare because they know that this is going for good purposes. So that's our little um, thing about what's coming up. There's also the food pant, uh, the soup kitchen fundraiser, um, which is what date is that? Thursday, the what? The 24th. So that's coming up very soon, and um, uh, tickets for that are $40. It's a, uh, there's four soup kitchens in our group, this one and uh, St. Francis de Sale, St. Joseph the Worker, and St. Paul's Episcopal Church over here on Ryder, with whom we have a joint uh, uh, food pantry relationship. Okay, 
That's all the way of saying, let us join in the morning prayer that is printed in this morning's bulletin. If you're joining us online, the morning prayer will be scrolling across the bottom of your screen. As we pray aloud and together, omnipresent God, to whom all hearts are open books, to whom all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our minds and the desires of our hearts. Inspire our love of you and majesty, magnify your presence within us. Amen. So, this is an unusual uh, scripture reading because it seems like the introductory music all over the place. But just listen to it and then we'll unpack it a little bit because there's a couple familiar phrases in there. Like if you don't know Shakespeare, all of a sudden you'll hear some great Shakespeare uh, hymn, uh, not hymn, but uh, phrase. And uh, the writing on the wall, you know, all of the, uh, so many phrases come out of that. Well, you'll hear a couple familiar phrases, and then we'll uh, look at it a little more closely. The scripture comes from um, the 10th chapter of Mark. As he, Jesus, as he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, good teacher, or what could be translated as rabbi or rabuni, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. And the disciples were also perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, repeating, because obviously they didn't get it or hear it the first time, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or mother or father or children or fields. No one has left those things for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Now, what the heck is that about? That's like that music. The mysteriousness of God well, I haven't begun my sermon, so you want to come up anyway? Oh, because I'm not reading the bulletin that I wrote. Okay, I thought I could goof it up again. Thank you for that opportunity. So now that we've heard that scripture, in my genius, I thought of and then completely forgot, a good way to, is to anchor it in some music. And then we'll go back and investigate and unwrap a little bit of what we've heard. So let us hear now a song called Jesus Calls Us or the Tumult, written by Cecil Alexander and David Hurd and performed by our choir 
that doesn't goof things up nearly as often as the pastor. You got a mouse in your shoes or something there, Stephen Martin? So that's what I was trying to say. That's what I was trying to say. Or the tumult. When things are tumultuous, what do we do? Well, sometimes that's a time of opportunity, especially if we get the guidance that we need and the guidance is available. So let's unpack that uh, scripture a little bit. And I'm starting to wake up. Starting to wake up. Here we go. Notice that when the man looked at Jesus and said, Rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It says in Scripture right up front, Jesus looking at him loved him. He loved him. Jesus responded to this question with love. Jesus didn't berate him or lecture him for being a materialistic rich man with no clue what's going on in life and could give a hoot about what happens to the poor. He didn't do any of that. He started with loving him. And then he said, so you know you're loved, and when you know you're loved, you can hear all sorts of bad news. You can hear all sorts of disappointing things. You know, like, I heard a guy, he was, he's a carpenter, but he was just brilliant. He was on the school board at one point or something. And he said that, you know, you always start when you're going to talk to the parents with, your kid is a really gifted, beautiful child, and I'm so happy to have that person here, although he gets sent to the principal's office three times a day. So there's room for improvement. You don't say, you know, of all the kids in this classroom, yours is the worst, the most problem. You don't start with that because no matter what you say, you've lost them. So in his wisdom, he loved him and said, you lack one thing. Oh, I only lack one thing. Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. 
The man came to Jesus not looking for a new car or some investment advice. He was looking for eternal life. That's not a small ask. How do I have eternal peace? Oh, boy. Well, first of all, thank you for asking. It shows your commitment. It shows your spirit. But you've got a long way to go. That would be a, a, a way to hear it. Okay, all I want is eternal life. What do I have to do? Jesus tells him what should have been the deal of the millennia. The deal of the millennia. Rid yourself of your money here. Give it to the poor who can sorely use it. And then you will have, this is a quote from the Bible, you will have treasure in your eternal life in heaven. And Jesus concludes his very brief and very clear response by saying, do this and then come follow me. You don't just follow Jesus before you find out what you, follow me, that, the Pied Piper. You know, the Pied Piper was followed by rats first and then children. I'm following this guy? Follow me, all the rats in town like me. Why not you? You know, like, no, no, no. Then, after you have done this, follow me. Now, here's a quote from the Bible. When he, you heard this, and we can hear it again. When he heard this, the man was shocked, and he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. This, by the way, is the sermon that rich people are supposed to be find deeply offensive. And it's like they've shut their mind and their ears and their hearts from the get-go. It's easier, for, for la, 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 that, you know, but, but maybe not. We'll see. So the rich man was shocked that Jesus, he was shocked that Jesus, otherwise known as Son of God, otherwise known as the Anointed One, otherwise known as the Alpha and Omega, otherwise known as the Messiah predicted in Hebrew Scripture for hundreds and hundreds of years, he was shocked that such a person as that would suggest that he let go of his bling to help the poor. I'm shocked. I went for religious advice and I got religious advice. I can't believe this. And the man left depressed. He left an encounter with Jesus depressed because while he could open his mouth to talk about Jesus and heaven and eternity, he couldn't open his wallet or he wouldn't open his wallet. So he walked away with his little feely wheelies hurt. He didn't get his way. Now remember that Jesus said these things to the man with love, not anger or judgment. Why not anger? Jesus gets angry in the Bible. He curses a fig tree. Go pick me some figs. Okay, uh, but Jesus, it's not season for figs, so there's, you know, the, uh, so he says, oh, well, and then he curses the fig tree and says, there will never be any figs growing on that fig tree for eternity. It's like in January, I say, okay, folks, if you really love me, go out and pick me some raspberries off the bushes out front. Well, do I? It's February. Then get out of here. <laughs> Just like, it makes no sense. This is the same guy. But he looks with love. So he's capable of anger. Jesus is capable of judgment but he responds with love to the person who is having such a hard time and is, a, is going to turn his back and walk away. Anybody watch The Chosen? So there's a, when, about Nicodemus' separate story. Jesus senses his presence and Nicodemus is standing around the corner of a building looking over and looking over it as, as the disciples are getting ready to leave. 
And Jesus just says, mutters to himself, he came so close. And then they leave without him. He came so close. He's around the corner, crying his eyes out, tortured, and he's going to be split for the rest of his life. He just couldn't do it. And then they leave. Back to this dude here, the unnamed rich man. The disciples were also perplexed at these words, of course. So Jesus put it another way to them and said, that weird phrase, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now that sounds like a real blowback. You know, it, the last person likely to get into heaven is somebody who's rich. And this has been used at, for people saying that Jesus' gospel is the gospel of the poor. I came not for the well. They, don't, they won't hear me and they don't need me. They won't listen. I'm doing fine. All you have to do is vote the right way and get a car like mine and work out in the gym, dental floss every night, and you can have all the love and all the money. I think he was telling a joke. You know, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than to get a squeaky $5 bill out of you, buddy. Now cough it up. We've got a soup kitchen. Then Peter, one of the disciples who was watching Jesus interact with this, this rich man who turns away dejected, then Peter, the first pope, is what he's called in the Catholic faith tradition. It's not a faith tradition. Catholic branch of Christianity. Don't get me going about how we have, like, well, are you, are you Christian or Catholic? I've heard that so many times. Is your church Christian or Catholic? I said, well, I would hope that the Catholic churches are Christian also. But anyway, Peter, the, the, you know, upon this rock I will build my church. The first pope, if you look at the Vatican, there's a statue of Paul and the other of Peter. So Peter is watching this interaction between Jesus and the rich man. You just turned away the guy who could have funded this whole thing. It's probably what he's thinking. And Peter said to Jesus, look, we, we have left everything and followed you. We've left, what about us? We've done what you said to him. We've left everything, money, family, home, career. And Jesus said, yeah, you left everything behind for my sake and for the sake of the good news of salvation and eternal life and a peace, love, understanding, Elvis Costello to follow me, but you need to remember you're also following me into persecutions. And only then, after abandoning your stuff, after sacrificing into the good news, but also into that the world is going to try to kill us for bringing this message in and for messing up Judaism because he was a renegade, apparently, especially Apostle Paul who comes along a few years later. But at that point, after doing all of this, only then and only after all of that will you follow me into eternal life. Not enough to have left family and career and sitting by a, a, a campfire. And then Jesus says the perplexing and very well-known saying, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Anybody ever heard that before? The first will be last, the last will be first. Anybody have a clue what it means? It means amen? Okay. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a complex the last will be first and the first will be last. So a few comments on this passage. Why give away everything you have to the poor? First, you can't take it with you. There are no luggage racks on hearses for a reason. But also, 
it seems to me that part of the process of letting, of getting closer to the Christ, I don't say Jesus Christ, Christ wasn't Jesus' last name, the Christ, the anointed one, uh, whatever words you maybe use for whoever this was. You can go back to Hebrew scripture and see the, this prediction. You can hear what people were saying about Jesus in his lifetime, the Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the alphabet. In other words, from the beginning to the end, however you define the Christ. Getting closer to Christ and to God is a process of emptying ourselves of our attachments. The Buddha said the same thing. He strived and strived, starved himself nearly to death. His name was Siddhartha. As a kid, he left a very wealthy family. He left his wife and child, Siddhartha Buddha, who became the Buddha, which is like becoming the, Jesus became the Christ or the, uh, Siddhartha became the Buddha. Um, in this process, he left everything behind and did all of these rigorous, ridiculous spiritual exercises that the gurus and the shamans or whatever in India were teaching him, and he was still miserable. Life is suffering. First thing that, that the Buddha said, life is suffering. Sounds familiar? But the pain comes from how we're attached to what causes us the suffering. It's the attachment to it. So if I can't live without him or her, lover, spouse, then when something happens, I collapse. It happens to me to people all the time with long-term marriages. One person goes before the other, and the other one goes within a year and a half. My father couldn't stand my mother. My mother couldn't stand my father. He died within 18 months of her death, and that's very common. And don't touch my dessert. If anybody knows me, yes, you can taste the entree if you want, and have a sip of the soup, but keep your hands off my pecan pie or you're going to get hurt. Because it's not because there's anything about pecans. It's my attachment to it. This is the best part. This is what I deserve. And for the young, rich man, it was his money. So if it could have been his drug habit. It could have been his cavorting with uh, sex trade workers. It could have been a million different things, his gambling or whatever. But what it was, the attachment was to his money. If I get enough money, I'll be safe. If I get enough money, I'll be a, 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 a citizen in a world who's respected. If I get enough money, I can run for office. If I get enough money, I'll be, I'll be honored in my community. I'll look like a big shot at the PTA. Because the, the first person, well, so-and-so just decided that they would buy the, the, the gold plate. $10,000, yay! No problem, no problem. It's that attachment. And then the money disappears, what do you have left? A useless disciple because they've collapsed into depression and pity and anger and whatever it happens because of the attachment. So it's not the money that is the problem. It's not the man that has the problem. It's that the man is attached to this and that can't let go of that. And it can be, like I said, fill in the blank. Love, power, cash, good looks, muscles, youth. That I'm white, and so I rule. Whatever you, yeah, well, just wait. Because like, God has a way of straightening things out. Like, if you need to work on patience, God in cleverness will put you ninth in line at the Walmart checkout counter when you have to pick up your kid in 20 minutes. Then we'll see what you're really made of. Get less attached to your possessions, thoughts, attitudes, and judgments. You have to be emptied in order to be filled again. So the rich man went away shocked and grieving at the mere thought of having to give away his possessions. But notice... 
The rich man did not give away shocked and grieving that Jesus reminded him that there are so many poor, starving people in Patchogue that need help. That wasn't shocking to him. What was shocking is he was expected to give up some of his money. This guy wasn't ready to follow Jesus. He wasn't ready. I, you know, like... I'm glad you guys are helping the poor. It's a great thing that our church is helping the poor, but you're, you're, you're part of the church. You're not contributing, not that you need to. Although we are talking about, how about contributing to peace, love, and understanding, for crying out loud, in a time when people could, and we know it, kill each other because of an election? We know it. We've seen it. Two assassination attempts on one of the candidates already? Or... The food pantry, the soup kitchen fundraiser. People are buying tickets that aren't members of this church. I know of eight of them that aren't coming to the fundraiser. They're buying a ticket because they know it's for four soup kitchens. If, I'm going to say Harbor Crab because I live near it. If Harbor Crab quadruples its business, the owner's going to get even richer than they already are. If the soup kitchen quadruples its business, we're going to get go bankrupt because we work for free. That's not something that you will contribute your wealth to? Then go do your homework. Do some spiritual. That's why Jesus loved him. Oh, kid, you're just not ready to be here. You're not getting it. How about the phrase that's often thought of as a put down, like I said, easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for someone to enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, have you ever tried to thread the eye of a needle? Rich, have you ever tried to thread the eye of a needle? <laughs> sure. Don't lie in church, man. Come on. This, next week, we're going to have Rich Miller sit up here and try to thread the eye of a needle. And when he's done, you get to leave. Bring a sleeping bag and some dinner. (laughs) It's not easy. It's hard to thread the eye of a needle. You have to have eye-hand coordination. No hand tremors. Threading a needle is not for the impatient or the temperamental. Would you get in a needle? Do you think I have all day? You know, to get... It's not an easy thing to do. So that's why I think it was a joke. A lot of people think it was a joke instead of a put down of the rich. It's just like, yeah, it's not easy for a rich man to let go of their, or a rich person to let go of their possessions. And it's because it's not easy to thread that needle. That's a hard needle to thread. This, you know, you can have possessions, but don't be so attached to them that they define you. And what about the, 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 the last shall be first stuff? The last shall be first and the first shall be last. Well, I've never believed or liked that one. I'm the youngest son of a career military officer. And in, I know for a fact that the last shall be last. I was never the first under any conditions. After playing softball, my brother would, would hold his hand over him. He, like, you, like the big the basketball players, their hands are so big, the ones that are 14 feet tall, they can glom a basketball and turn it upside down and stuff like that. He did that to my face while we were both sweating and sort of slowly drank a Coca-Cola. Ah. Like I'm dying of thirst. He's holding me away. Oh, I will be first. No, 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 no. So what's going on there? In this story, those who are willing and perhaps even eager to share. Those who are willing or even eager to assist the poor, as Jesus required, didn't request, required. 
when I was hungry, you fed me. When I, you'll hear this until the day I leave here, and hopefully you'll, and I bet you, you'll hear it from somebody who might succeed me, and I bet you, you heard it from the one who preceded me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you nursed me. When, you, when I was out in the hospital, you gave me a call. Those ones are not going to walk away if they don't get their way. The ones trained and capable of threading the needle of life are the ones who will also get through to the other side of many seemingly difficult situations. I'm always trying to thread the needle in this church, in my home, with my grown children with uh, inflation and outpacing income, on and on and on, threading the needle of relationships, threading the needle with coworkers like Craig with working on music, on and on and on. The leaders of the early church, the leaders of the early church were at first followers. And when one of my daughters had to fled flee their home in North Carolina, not poor, not they don't think they're rich, but they had a house in North Carolina and a house in Florida, in Sarasota. They fled their house in North Carolina because it got flooded. And they said, thank God we got out in time, and they made it to their house in Sarasota, which they had to flee because it flooded. And then they went back to the house in North Carolina where there's no electricity and barely could get there because they live in the country and the, the, the trees are all down. Where are we going to go, she said to me on the phone. I said, pull into the parking lot of a church. What? Pull into the parking lot of a church. Church folk know how to help. Church folk have cots, hot plates, extension cords, blankets, food pantries, soup kitchens, people who know how to cook, how to serve, how to thank you for coming in. And they also have Bibles, which include Hebrew Scripture and Christian Scripture, of course, where stories like this await us to give us strength in times like that. Before Superstorm Sandy, I came here from Florida, where I served 10 years in Florida, and I survived four hurricanes. Four hurricanes. So when I came up here, I said, we're overdue for a hurricane. At a church meeting, it was a, a multi-church meeting and that at the state level. And I said that, and somebody said, shh, you're going to jinx us. That's your plan for hurricane in New York? Shh, that's it? That was the attachment was to delusion, not to money. So when Superstorm Sandy was coming, I and a couple volunteers, precious few of us, but I think there were three of us, went to the uh, apartment building there on Maple Avenue. We went to houses and to stores. And that with a flyer and said, if we, if you lose electricity and we have it, if you lose heat and we have it, come to the church. If we're dark, don't come to the church. Well, we didn't lose power. So people came in here and we offered them an opportunity to charge their cell phones. They had no electricity. We had cookies, coffee, some soft drink, bottles of water and we played piano for them and gave them an opportunity to light a candle. That cost us, all told, less than a dollar a person. And this response, I thought, was, thank you. And it was. But another response that I couldn't have anticipated when they sat here eating a cookie, drinking some coffee, their phone is charging, they light a candle, and they're seeing somebody playing piano. The shoulders went down, and they started weeping. 
not everybody, but many of them started weeping because that was what was pent up in there. They were attached to fear, of course. And when we let it go, then we could say, you know, we're going to get through this. I don't remember who the musician was at the time. This was pre, pre your tenure. In conclusion, what about that man who went away shocked and grieving? Shocked that he had, that you would say, give, me, give away the money, and grieving that he wanted to be with Jesus. And he left. That's the end of the story in the Bible, but I, I'm going to carry that forward a bit. What if he came back and said, I'll give you half. That's not good enough. Um, I'll give you a tithe. You're a rabbi. It says 10%. I'll give you a tithe. I'll give you 10% of my fortune. What would Jesus have said? The guy's, he, 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 he's, he, that attachment is loosening. He's saying, you know, there's got to be a better way. I'm not ready to walk away. Or what if the rich man came back and said, yeah, you're right. I'll do it because I know me. I can, I can get another fortune, and I can give this away, and I'll keep giving it away, and we'll keep supporting this movement until it takes off. Maybe he did that. I'll end on a couple questions for you. How has your faith tested you? If you, if you say it hasn't, we need to talk. You know, we need to talk. Just think of the things that have happened where your faith has been tested. Another question, what sacrifice or commitment are you willing to make now going forward? Not did you, com did you make. What commitment or sacrifice, and I'm not necessarily saying to the church, although we need your help, not just the soup kitchen. We're spending a lot more money than we're bringing in. If that's not obvious, we need to talk. Look at this place. Can you imagine me going to the trustees saying, well, I, I just bought a house. It looks, here's the pictures of it. It looks like this. And I need a dramatic increase in my salary to pay for it. <laughs> what would they say? You better move. You got to move. You got to move out of that place. But even in, in the level of a personal commitment, what sacrifices or commitments are you willing to make? But let's keep it about the church because in a couple of weeks we're coming up on so stewardship season where we say, okay, are you willing to make a commitment so that we can, we can bank on it? Because we can't budget if we don't know what's coming in. Nobody can. You've got to know what your salary is before the bank will give you a loan, and they'll determine the loan on the basis of what you can afford to pay because they're not going to get foreclosure papers going, and you don't want to be out on the streets in front of your a beautiful place. What commitments are you willing to make, even small commitments, to get that movement going to a more mature spirituality that's not attached to, well, why should I give money to something? We've always got those in our mind. And finally, what needle of faith are you trying to thread? What needle of faith that in a world like this, we can still, with people laughing at people who go to church, where we receive no support for trying to feed hungry and homeless people. As a matter of fact, we're treated with disdain because we do it. And no government support because of the separation of church and state. 
We're trying to thread that needle. We're trying to thread the needle of feeding people for free. And one way we can thread that needle is to keep, make it fun, hopeful, helpful. So, what needle are you willing to thread? And for 50 bucks, I'll stop my sermon. Do I hear 60? Do I hear 70? <laughs> Dennis, Dennis waved. Okay, 50 buck commitment over there. Known as Rich has got his arms folded over his shoulders, but that's a different story. <laughs> now let's hear an anthem. Oh, how coincidental. I will follow. Written by Chris Tomlin, Jason Ingram, Reuben Morgan, and performed for us by the Congregational Choir. look like you just ate turnips or something. You should be smiling. That was beautiful. That was beautiful. Wasn't it? Round two. Encore. <laughs> okay. So in this church and in uh, untold numbers of churches around the world and through millennia, we have paused to say a prayer. 
And the prayer that we will pray is one that has become known as the Lord's Prayer. There are many versions of this. Catholics uh, drop off the last line, etc., etc. Some people use the word trespasses or sins or debts. Some people prefer not to pray at all and uh, go into silence. All of that is perfectly acceptable as we, using whatever words with which you may be most familiar, say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, rich people, we do live in a very wealthy country. I complain about it to my son who's studying for an MBA in, in Chicago, a Master of Business Administration. I complain about taxes and all that, and he said, our taxes are nothing compared to what they are in Europe. They're doing 40, 50 percent. Um, and it reminds me that, that we, we all hopefully have a little bit to spare. If we do, your uh, financial gifts will now be re gratefully received. If you're unable to contribute for whatever reason at this time, know that your presence alone is truly a great gift. If you're joining us on social media right now at this point or later on at a YouTube link, when the service is over or after you're done viewing this or you can stop viewing this on, on YouTube when this is, uh, becomes a link, go to our website, churchonmainstreet.org, churchonmainstreet.org. Upper right-hand corner of the opening page is a donate button. Click on it. It will take you directly to a secure PayPal link. If that doesn't work, then um, you can pass a, a check to the mail slot on the front door, mail it to us. If you want to help, you'll find a way. Well, that's done. And even though it's not, we're going to go ahead anyway. Just a closer walk with thee. People know that song? I had no idea it was in the hymnal when I heard like Tammy Wynette or whoever it was that sang that once upon a time. Just like I thought Cat Stephen wrote, Morning is Broken. <laughs> okay, just a closer walk with the hymn number 394 in the hymnal in the back of the pew right in front of you. Are there any lyrics to this, uh, Will, online? So there are lyrics to Just a Closer Walk to Thee that will scroll with thee that will scroll across the bottom of your screen when we start, which is bada boom.
You may be seated to receive the benediction and to listen to, now that we're back in the sanctuary and summer is war, um, Craig is going to kick out some of the dust from those 2,000 pipes behind us. Now in our going, when we are called upon to give sacrifice, to share, when we're confused or downtrodden like the hymn we just sang said, let us always remember that in our weakness is an opportunity to be receptive to God's strength. In our doubt, there is an opportunity to turn from doubt to certitude. And in our lack of direction comes a path. And in our striving for leadership in various roles in our life, let us also remember the glory of following. Following someone or something, trying to do something good in this world. Peace, love, understanding. May the light of God shine down upon you and out from within you and be a blessing to you as you are indeed a blessing to others.